Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Joining Michael on the show today is Eric Rich. Eric leads the growth at Elixir. Eric has more than 25 years of consulting experience and is a recognized leader in advising clients around innovation operating models and design thinking, technology enablement, business transformation, and cost reduction process improvement initiatives. Eric has spent his career driving complex transformational programs for some of the world's largest global companies across most major industry segments and geographies. But before we dive into today's episode, are you ready to grow and take your consulting business to the next level? Many of the clients we work with started as podcast listeners just like you. And a consistent theme they have shared with us is they had wished they had reached out sooner about our clarity coaching program rather than waiting for that perfect time. If you're interested in learning more about how we help consultants just like you, we are offering a free, no pressure growth session call. We're on the call. We will dive deep into your goals, challenges, and situation and outline a plan that is tailor-made just for you. We will also help you identify where you may be making costly and time-consuming mistakes to ensure you're benefiting from proven methods and strategies to grow your consulting business. Don't wait years to find clarity. If you're committed and serious about reaching a new level of success in your consulting business, go ahead and schedule your free growth session call today. Just visit consultingsuccess.com forward slash grow to book your free call today. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit more about what you're going to learn in today's episode with Eric. First is how to craft a winning business development framework that sets you apart. How to identify and dominate your niche to consistently secure new business. How to build unshakable trust with your customers, turning them into loyal advocates how to accelerate the sales process, transforming prospects into customers faster, and how to articulate your unique selling points clearly, plus so much more. Here to share with you his story and insights is Eric Rich. Enjoy. What does good business development look like in your mind? Are there frameworks or, or principles that you focus on when you think about kind of the concept and area of business development itself? It's a complex topic. I mean, business development is, is uh, if it were easy, everyone would do it and be successful at it. But I think to me, there's a lot of different components of it. I mean, you, you talk about like, what is the market opportunity? What are your capabilities? How do they align? Where do you want to focus your efforts when you're talking about building a business? And in my mind, not about getting fancy and just trying to sell everything that, that a client mentions that they want, but it's really thinking about what are the things we're really good at and where do we like stand apart and have something to offer that others don't. And, you know, in the consulting world, I think that comes down to how you approach clients and what you mean to clients and what type of work you want to do with them. For me, it's always been about they have objectives as a business and they're hiring us to achieve those objectives. So how can we help them? And it's not about I have something I think they need and let me go push push something on them and sell a product or a canned offering. But it's more about they know their business better than I do. I, I'm never going to doubt that. But I do need to know about their business. And they will have challenges where the experiences I've had as a consultant will be applicable. So how can I take my understanding and quickly understand what they're trying to do and then marry that up with what are the capabilities we're strong at. So these can be anything from a strategy to an operating model to a process transformation. It can involve capabilities like data and digital and the things that we, we see a lot of today as enabling technologies. And so if you come in with a toolkit of understanding of the business, a set of uh, capabilities that you can bring to the table and a framework to, under which to work. So how do I start? What do I do first? I really want to understand the problem they're trying to solve, make sure we're working on the right thing. And then how do I bring something of value to that problem? And to me, it's a relationship, Michael. I mean, it's not, I'm purposely in the company I'm in today because we sell on relationships. We don't compete on RFPs and RFIs. And it's not about price. It's not about who has the most case studies. It's about, can I build a relationship where the client trusts and will see me as a partner, not as a vendor and that kind of thing. And that's how, that's how I like to develop businesses. And it takes time, right? It's, it's of course, 
be a journey, but you've got to have enough going at all times where you're not suddenly off all my projects and then I've got to now go spend a year developing business. It's a process of keeping a pipe full and building big accounts to build off of. So let me ask you, because you, know, you talked about the importance of identifying the problems, kind of what's top of mind for the buyer or the prospective client. So you're not just coming and saying, this is what we have to offer and therefore you need it. It's, it's really that that kind of customization or, or making sure that, that it's relevant. And if, if I paint a very broad, kind of two broad brush strokes, I think there's, there's two camps. There's the camp of people who believe that you need to spend a lot of time having deep, meaningful conversations with buyers to understand what problems they have and where the opportunity might lie. And then you have this other camp that believes it's less about asking questions initially and more about just saying, here's the data in the market. Here's what's going on. Here are the problems. Are you having these problems? And of course, they're asking questions, but one seems to lead more with a mindset of, let's just get in there, get our foot in the door, and then we're going to ask a lot of questions. The other seems to come in with a lot more. We've already done the homework. We know the industry. We know the data. Where do you kind of sit on that? What's your view of those two? It's a really challenging topic because there's merits to both. I mean, you have to be relevant and you have to get in front of clients proactively. So you can't like expect like these conversations, they're going to give me two hours to sit and listen to them. So you have to really get your ad bats and take advantage of them. So a lot of times, and we do both and I do both. It's a lot of times of thinking about what are the, the hot topics right now? And how do I find an opportunity to tell a client, I have something to say about this topic, you should talk to me. But when I get that that moment, it's now I want to listen. What are they saying? Because is it really their interest in this topic or is there something else underlying here that they're trying to achieve? And how do I t- translate that into an opportunity? And I like to look at it that way as I have to be, I always feel like we need to be ahead of our clients on what's happening, next. not necessarily their industry, but what's happening in the world with technology, data, you know, all these things that are changing very fast now. And that's creating these opportunities for people. So if I can go talk about an opportunity with a client it, with a business slant on it, like what does this really mean to your customers or your experience or your business or your onboarding process or whatever it is. And if I can find clients to target that, that's relevant to them. So maybe it's somebody who leads account opening or customer service or, you know, and then what are the five things they're going to be interested in? Can I get a meeting by saying something smart about that and getting them interested? And then really sitting and say, okay, before I dive in and tell you all about how great I am, tell me what your job and your role is and what are you doing? What's on your agenda? And by listening, almost creating or co-creating the opportunities to go after with them. And that's where I think the balance is. So let me just try and summarize that for everybody and, and let me know if this is accurate or if I'm missing something. It sounds like what you're saying is you lead with, you, you've already collected the data, you understand the industry, you you have, as you said, maybe a top three or five main points that are going to be relevant to that buyer. And that's what you use to get the meeting, kind of to, to hook them in. Once you actually sit down, that's where you're going to spend more time asking the questions to really understand the human, the person, before you just start talking about the problem. And then you're going to explore both the person and the problem. Okay. Because, because I may not have the right understanding of the problem. They may not know the problem. <laughs> you know, who knows? Right? So it's like by listening, you can kind of get to, are you sure that's what you're really telling me is, you know, maybe it's something else we should go after. But I, I think, and doing it in a way that's collaborative, because I've been in that environment where it's, you know, we're pushing sales and volume and, you know, we're trying to sell the next deal. And there's something in the market that says it's shooting fish in a barrel. So, you know, everyone needs it. I'm going to get five out of 25 attempts. I'm going to close something. That environment, I think, has come and gone. I mean, I think that was when there was a lot of back office transformation projects with big software that was that was happening a lot. But I think now you really have to get someone's attention by saying something that I'm going to put in front of you now will help you achieve or exceed your goals and what you're trying to do as a business and framing it that way so that they see it and they understand it. And, you know, but, but again, like when I get a meeting with someone, whether no matter what channel it comes in and there's lots of channels, but I know who they are. I know what their role is. I know their business. I can find out things pretty quickly enough to say they are probably interested in these three or four topics. So let me at least present somebody to them and says, Hey, I'd like to get, I don't have time or I'd like to get with you. Here's some things I think we could talk about. Is there anything else on your mind? And then once you get there, I rarely will bring a lot of presentation material to an initial meeting. It's a conversation and that gets them comfortable that you're not just here to sign a contract and leave. And you're actually going to be the person helping me. And, and the next thing I do, honestly, every time is 
I try to be helpful first first thing out of the first action. What can I do for this person? Send them, introduce them to somebody, send them an article or a research paper, or even build something, you know, a few slides for them to say, here's what I heard and here's some things for you to think about. Not a proposal, not a price document, right? Now, that's an entry of a, of a new relationship. Once you're in, it's very different. Now I know your business, right? Now I'm sitting, and again, our clients are, are senior level execs. So I know what's happening in your unit. I know what's happening, what your M&A strategy is. I know how you guys are you know, uh, expanding or what new products you're going after. And then I can start to think about my experience of being in similar companies. What are the things that caught that, that got them in the end? Or what are the things that actually were great ideas or how did they go about it? And then you're looking at like, how can I be part of your team with that executive? You know, how can I bring stuff to you as a benefit of working with our firm? I will bring you ideas and things and just that's basically free advice. But with the spirit of, you know, we're going to be part of your growth plan. So I want to talk, yeah, go a little bit deeper into what you did early on at Elixir in the role of business development and really coming over from, so Elixir, UK-based company, but your role is to really open up the the US market, right? To expand in, into the US market. But before we do that, I want to go a little bit more into this idea of get, you know creating the at-bats, as you call it, creating the opportunities to actually, where somebody's going to say yes to an appointment and meeting. When you identify an ideal client, right? Somebody that you want to do business with, right? So very clearly you're leading with the idea of, I'm going to build a relationship with this person before I even talk to them about how we can specifically help them, which is sounds, that's fantastic. But how do you identify, how do you get to the point where you think here's the three or five things that I should put in, in front? Like, how do you go about, if you could just share that process of developing the hook, developing that initial outreach, that message that's going to get somebody to say, okay, Eric, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to carve out time to, to speak with you. It's a, let me just make it a, a bit of a broader answer than that. So the first most important thing is who are you going to target, right? And I think, and this has been a, a very, I had to re reestablish and reinvent myself coming to Elixir because in my prior firms, they were big consulting firms and well-established. We had sales team. I was a, here's a lead, go close it kind of a leader, right? And this is very different. So when I joined Elixir in 2016, so it's been, you know, eight years or so. I was the only one in the U.S. Like this was a like we had Elixir. I could, you know, if I had done it on my own, I wouldn't have had the benefit of we have Elixir and we do things, and I could like take those ideas and and build on them. But I had no team, no brand, you know, nothing other than contacts and relationships. And so early days, it was about just exploring the market and getting out there and say like, how do I figure out even who to sell to for like what type of role in an organization, what type of companies, what industries. And that's a process that you have to learn very fast or you're going to fail because you need clients. Right. And then once I have a success, how can I build on that by that client recommending me within their company or to their network or whatever. And so, you know, there's the way I go about it and think about it is do you have all these channels, right? Their client relationships, their past relationships, their conferences, or, you know, getting yourself out there on marketing platforms. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do it, right? You can, partnerships, et cetera. And so you have all those channels and you say, I'm going to keep these going until I realize it's not bringing me success and I'm going to double down on another one. And then you start to learn the process of what the, the capabilities we have in the market trends and demands that are happening whether it's across industry or within industry, where is there a market for some of those things here that I can actually go after based on who do I know and how does it align up with their company? And, and so you start to explore and you realize, hey, we're really good and strong in bank retail banking. And there's a huge market in the US of regional banks and they're a good size to sell to because they may not get the attention of the big consulting firms all the time. They're not Chase and Bank of America. And so that's a good opportunity space for me to go after. And once I start going after it, I realize a lot of them are doing data and insights driven work, right? And so I have a data capability. That's a good, who, who does data stuff? Business leaders, CDOs, you know, CIOs, et cetera. And then you hone in on what is it about banking and data that there's a, a message around or a, a topic around? Is it cross-selling? Is it customer service and, you know, better experience? Is it onboarding efficiency? What are those things? And then do those, do I have capabilities to do those things, right? And Eric, do you usually learn that from the conversations that you're having as you reach out to those people? Or do you find that you learn, you get a lot of that kind of intel from reading? It's, you have to do your own work, but it's test and learn. You, like there's nothing better than going out and having a conversation and realizing that didn't work. <laughs> and versus like be reading a bunch of stuff, because if you're not out in the market, you're, you're not going to learn. And even from early in my career, you know, I realized I, I made a decision to go out and get a job after my bachelor's degree and I, I thought MBA down the road maybe. And I realized like I'm learning more doing work in the field, you know, doing an implementation in a refinery and seeing how a refinery works 
is a gold mine way be- way better than a textbook. And so that philosophy has always stuck with me and you, use, you apply it in sales and business as well. If I don't get out and try, now I might try with a warm, friendly person and test something with someone I know first before I go like try it with someone and, and lose, a, lose a potential client forever, right? Because I've offended them in some way. But it's really, you have to learn and, and you start to learn what works and you learn the process you go through that works. And it's not the same for every, all of our partners sell differently. They all have different ways of doing it, but we're all selling similar themes and outcomes. And, you know, like why, why are we going to, why does our approach work better? We all sell that the same, but I might try to, to sell to a certain channel differently than somebody else has a different way of accessing clients, you know, that we all have our ways that work for us. And, and that's what we do. People often say that when an executive, a new CEO comes on board or, or somebody, you know, a leader in an organization, the first 90 days are, are critical, right? I was going to say that. I, I, was, I just forgot. Absolutely. Yeah. New executive in a new, in a new firm is, is yeah. a Yeah. And so my, my, I mean, that can often be a trigger, right? In terms of who to target, right? So as a consultant or right firm owner, you might find the people that are new in roles that can be a, a goldmine of opportunity, but l- let me shift the question a little bit and you know, thinking about your experience now, I know it's been eight years since you've been at Elixir, but if you were a consulting firm owner and let's say you were new to go to market, you had expertise for maybe many years in the business, or maybe you've been consulting for, for a period of time, but you really want to take things to the next level. And, and you felt like, okay, I have 90 days to really make something work here. What would you, what would you do or are there any lessons from what you've seen and what you did? Like, would you do anything differently from what you did back eight years ago in those first 90 days, how you approach that kind of critical period? You're making the assumption that the first 90 days were successful. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, like, like getting attraction. I mean, again, that was a big reason why I joined Elixir because there was a successful firm already running and I could take some time to like figure out what I'm going to do in this market and get help and advice from the people that had gone through it before me. It's not easy. And the biggest thing that surprised me, so, I mean, I grew up in a, in a big consulting firm and kind of advanced. And then my second opportunity that I pursued was a new consulting capability in a bigger IT services firm, which was different, right? And that was a very different way to sell and, you know, approach the market. When I came to the Elixir for the first time, it was, this is now roll up your sleeves and get out in the market and make a market. Like you've got to go be a market maker. And that meant like I had to be open to, I think I'm selling this today, but next week it might be a whole different idea because it's like getting traction, right? And it might be a different type of client. And I might, you know, I mean, I did oil and gas for 25 years and I've done nothing but banking and insurance and you know, at Elixir. It's just finding your way. But the first 90 days, again, I think the most important thing is I very quickly have to get a grip on the market, the white space in the market. Why am I in existence today? What am I going to do and, and to position myself as something different, right? Because because if I if I end up competing against known brands, we know what happens. And if I end up competing against people who can undercut me on a strategy project because they're going to get downstream work and I don't do that work, I know what happens. So you have your basic, like the idea I have, just like any startup, the idea I have is go in the market and this is the white space and I'm going to figure it out in two weeks. If does it really work or not? And if it's not, I need to start saying, what part of it can I turn into something new and a new idea and, and go after that? So I almost would say in this particular type of a business that you must do what we preach to our clients, which is have a hypothesis, and test and learn and, and make no doubt about it. The most critical thing for us is you've got to start contributing numbers to the business or it doesn't last long. <laughs> the business or you. Hey, it's Michael here and we'll be right back to the podcast. But first, are you ready to grow, scale and take your consulting business and marketing to the next level? If so, our Clarity Coaching Program may be a great fit for you. You'll work with our experienced team to set up a strategic plan for your business and coach you step-by-step in areas like how to consistently attract more leads, develop a magnetic message that resonates with your ideal clients, strategically package and position your services, earn higher fees, win more proposals, and scale your business. To find out more about Clarity Coaching and apply, go to consultingsuccess.com and click on Coaching. You talked about different clients, different industry, different sectors that you've worked in, and also the importance of going out there, kind of validating the market, having conversations, having maybe a hypothesis or or some assumptions, but being willing to adjust based on what you see in the market. And I'm wondering, what lessons have you learned about ideal client selection? What stands out for you? Like maybe just even taking some stories. Like there's some examples. And I mean, when you, one of the tenants is like an executive an experienced executive in a new firm, that's a category, right? The We call it the middle market 
America. But I mean, honestly, these are massive companies, right? They have lots and lots of money. But there's this underserved market of mid-market energy companies. There's lots of them. Public utilities, regional banks, 1 billion to 4 billion companies. You know, there's lots of them out there. And if you find the ones that are growing, you know, and you can see it growing, you can see their valuation growing, you can see their revenue growing, you can see their services kind of growing, you can see them becoming more prevalent. And those are the guys that need, they're running their business probably like they were when they were 500 million. And they need operational help, they need op models, they need they need to really understand digital and the relationship with their customers and their, and their people, their employees and users. Like how do they run their business, how do they run their supply chain with digital those are the kind of things that I look for and say, like, these are, and like, when you're looking at stuff like that, it doesn't really, to me, like those early days, I wasn't so worried about the industry. I was more worried about the type of common problems they are all going through. You know, COVID was a new set of problems. You know, like a lot of companies had a new set of problems to deal with. So it wasn't like, I'm just going to be a niche in this industry. It was, I'm going to look at the space of revenue growth and innovation and cost optimization and efficiency, two very big buckets. Now, what within those, how does digital and data play in those? How does innovation, how do you create innovative ways of working when you're solving problems in each space? What does a, you know, the question I always, you know, what does good look like in an op model for, you know, this type of business, for a B2B business? How can you take a sales prospecting process and clean it down to minimal time so you can spend all your time closing deals? Like Those are the kind of things that you think about these problems and you target them at the sales organization in any B2B company it doesn't have to be this industry. Yeah. Is there anything that knowing what you know now you would do differently, you know, with the benefit of hindsight in terms of how you go about selecting who to focus on? My biggest learning coming over to this type of consulting business was I had to shake my years and years and years of experience of selling templated solutions to the market. And you just got to go out there and like, say like, you need this, you need this, right? And I really learned like that relationship, trust, you're really understanding your client that it's almost like intimacy. I, like I'm giving you the feeling that I care about your business. And, and I do because it's fun. And like, it's interesting. And I want to be a partner in your success. And if my, if your outcome is what I care about, then you're going to trust me and you're going to know I'm going to be there. And even if we hit a you know a problem, I'm going to be there to solve it. And, you know, so what I learned, that's not to say I, did, I didn't have that, that feeling way back then, but, but it was much easier to sell a bigger firm because you were just getting stuff served up to you. This was different. And so, what I learned about that was I may have had a relationship with a client in a big company for, for 20 years. They're not my buyer because they're still in the organization that buys from the big guys and they're not going to get fired over hiring me. I have to go out and find new new customers and new clients. And what I found was a lot of people will say like when they're growing up to this more levels in their career where they're responsible for revenue and building and growing a business, they will say, well, but I don't have a network. Like, I don't have a black book of executives to sell to. And the moment you challenge them and say, and, and I learned this very quickly, it's the people that you see every day that you, you know, go meet for drinks that are your friends, that you, your family events, your uncles and aunts, they're probably executives in some firm somewhere. Find out what they do. <laughs> Talk to them. Like, like really have discussions about what do you do and what are you excited about what your company's doing and learn from that. And then like, I'm not saying sell to them, but like learn from them and then take those ideas and, and go think about it. Like, is there an opportunity in the market for that? You have to find the market opportunity. And the other thing I learned was it's going to change every three months, right? Like in today's environment, like if I don't keep current on what's happening with especially technology and innovation, I'm going to miss the window. Like I have to constantly be knowing for, and things come and go like, like, you know, you think about the discussions a, a year and a half ago were blockchain and crypto. And I mean, that's kind of like disappeared and people are now talking about other things, <laughs> AI and ML. And so you, you have to like really think about what is the topic people are, are talking about. And for a while it was ESG, for a while, you know, it was return to work and return to office. What do I do with all this space? You know, that's going to constantly change. So you have to think about, I have a set of capabilities that can be applied to any type of problem. I just need to understand the problem. And you start to find those nuances in every problem has a similar thing, which is getting a piece of information from one point to another point faster or whatever it is, taking a lot of data and giving insights. And I think if you if you can work with like that framework and then be smart and be clever on how to apply it, then you'll have success. Focusing on relationships kind of by default or, or definition usually means slower. You're giving yourself more time. It's more that long-term mindset. You're not rushing, right? You're not trying to persuade or, or push. What are you seeing right now kind of in you know the markets that, that you work in? 
what is the length of that typical sales cycle from initial conversation to actually sign on the dotted line? What does that look like? Today? I mean, of course, the answer I'll give you is it depends, but but uh, but, but no, I can give you some some a range, thoughts. yeah. So, what's that? A range, maybe. Of what yeah, you're seeing. no, it could be. You know, typically, it's in a really really fast cycle. It's two three months, and in a typical cycle, it's probably a year of investment. But I will tell you this: I learned this from actually doing consulting. We used to do these big transformation change projects, and the biggest failure point was always. We got to the end and then we rolled it out to people and they weren't ready for it. And it's the same thing I always would have said, if we would have got them ready before and made that investment, it would have cost more in the first phase, but we wouldn't have all this problem at the back end. It's the same thing with sales. So I can spend a year like really developing a, a good relationship with the business and a client and proving myself. Like maybe I invest a project for them or maybe I, you know, I do something at, a, at an investment price or whatever. But what that is building for me is I'm reducing and eliminating my future sales costs. I've got a client now that's buying for me on a capacity model and I don't even have to really go sell anymore. Like I just sign a contract every year and they just do call offs from it. What does that say to me? Like that's business I have. I don't have to go do another year to get that business. That's how I build. So at all times, I do have these five, six, seven conversations that are going to take six months. And I know that. And I have to be patient with it. And finally, you know, the one thing that's okay, now let's do something. But I've also got this existing business. And the hard thing about starting a company or a market is getting that kind of platform and starting to have that foundation to build on. Yeah. I mean, I guess in my assumption would be that in your position where the business is already, it already exists, there's already cash flow coming in. You're in a position where, where you can take a little bit longer. Of course, you have to deliver, I'm sure, showing progress and results and you're going in the right direction. But the paycheck is coming in while you're doing that. For somebody who is maybe running a much smaller firm, they need to find ways to bring business in sooner. What advice might you have for somebody who is in a position like that? It's a great question. And to be clear, like we run a profitable growing company. So it is very important to bring results in early on. So it's not any different than what you're explaining. But I think what you have to be willing to do and really get your head around is number one, this is not easy. Number two, you've got to be willing to sell what you can sell. And that's like, I might have a vision of like, I want to be the best AI company in the world. But if I can sell a data strategy project to that client because they, they know I'm smart about data, I've got to do that to get my revenue coming in and to have that opportunity to kind of grow my business with that client. So you have to be willing to kind of pivot quickly into where is my fastest path to revenue coming in. And I mean, I hope people are learning now with what's happened the past few years that not everyone can have a startup. Like you really need to earn your right to do that. And it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. And so my advice to people just starting off on this journey would be get your experience, like like take your cycles and really learn from people who are doing it and doing it successfully and then start to try to do it. But, it, you know, there's so many people that see it and I want to do that. I want to be a founder. And, and then they realize like, oh, the investment that my you know friends gave me runs out in three months. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it takes work. That's that's for sure. I, I want to ask you about uh, differentiation. You mentioned maybe a couple of times earlier in the conversation about kind of finding where you fit in the, in the market. And I think Elixir today maybe does roughly about a hundred million or over a hundred million us dollar equivalent, give or take. Cause I'm, am, am I in the ballpark? Yeah. Ballpark. yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a public data. So we're, yeah, you okay. Can, we're yeah, we're somewhere, ballpark. somewhere around that from, from what I saw that was public information and I'm just going from pounds into us dollars. So if we compare that, let's say to a McKinsey, right? That's about one tenth, give or take what McKinsey is. So Elixir is still a very established company, right? In terms of revenue size, but still much smaller than some of these very large organizations, let's say like, like a McKinsey. So when you think about going to market and you think winning business, is it focusing on the companies that aren't going to be going to the likes of McKinsey to, to or so to walk us through that? Because I think there's obviously a lot of, consulting firms. There's a lot of firms that pro provide strategy advice and advice on AI and data and innovation. So that by itself isn't unique. And what I'm interested in is like, what do you focus on to, to bring out the unique aspect, the advantage that your company has? How do you communicate that? It's that's a challenge. And, and I think, and it does, even in our, even in Elixir, it varies by market. Like how do we you know position ourselves in Europe and UK might be different than here. But generally speaking, I'm not looking to avoid accounts where McKinsey has a relationship, I'm looking to say, what can I do? I mean, we do hold, I mean, we pride ourselves in being better than, I mean, that's what we're striving for, right? But I've done a lot of projects alongside or in the same ballpark or, you know, in the same client as some of those names. And what I think 
the niche that we found in the U.S. when we started having success here, you know, eight years ago was there are a couple things that people aren't doing well or that clients are getting frustrated with. with. So if you take a topic like innovation or even AI or something, like, you can have a strategy and you can talk about a strategy, and you, but who is out there actually having a very brief discussion about strategy to understand like, what is your business really trying to do? And then saying, here's an application in your business that we can actually prove out to understand what the strategy should really be, right? Let's do something. And it's that like, breaking down a big, broad strategy of where do I want to be in 10 years to a, what is my strategy to solve that? What are the enabling tools and prove it to me? Like show me the results. So so I call it almost strategy through outcome or strategy through execution, get it done, get, you know, execute and, and get me an outcome. And then show me what worked and didn't work in terms of what you said the strategy should be. And let's, let's modify the strategy and, and do the next. One. And so I think it was that talking about like, let's do something with clients instead of like, because they're getting tired of hearing about it, right? And so let's do something and let's help you get the support internally and the funding you need to actually do what your vision is or to deliver your what you've committed to, you know, your stakeholders or your clients or your customers. And I think by having that attitude of like, we're in this with you, like if the outcome's not there, we're going to keep working until it is there. We're going to figure it out. And if we're both wrong, at least you did it for 100K or 150K in six weeks. If not, I did a whole year strategy for you and gave you some ideas. And by the way, we missed the boat and you spent a lot of money on me. I think that was one thing is that attitude of we're entrepreneurs, you're an entrepreneur in your role in the company. You're trying to do something and achieve some goal and you have ideas and you need to like be a creative and innovative about how you get them to market. And I'm this with you. Like, this is our thing. Let's go do this. That was kind of the, the thing that got people like, oh, this is refreshing. You guys are actually going to do something. And, you know, oh, wow, you have relationships that can do it faster. That's great. And I think that was that kind of speed, quality outcome was what got us some traction. Now, the other important thing was we built very quickly on it. We showcased it. And then we, you know, we said like, okay, we'll do this with you as an investment, but you, but we want you to make some interest for us or those kind of things. And that's how we kind of built momentum around getting noticed and, you know, and getting some at-bats and, and getting, you know, our story right. And how do we message things and how do we have success on selling? I want to also touch on cultural differences or, or potential cultural differences. So, I mean, you've worked with companies that are based in different places around the world. Today, your role is in, you know, the folks on the U.S. market. And as you said, eight years ago, you opened up the U.S. market for Elixir. What have you found? Anything that kind of stands out to you in terms of the difference of how different countries, different places think about consulting and, and how consulting work is done and you can go broader in terms of strategy, but just anything that kind of stands out like, oh yeah, they, they're really different here because we have a global audience. So I just want to kind of have you share anything that stands out for you. Just a, a little bit of, of probably new new context. So we are shifting to, I mean, we're evolving all the time. So we're kind of moving now to a, you know, from a GTM approach and go to market, like we are, it's like I've taken on some leadership globally for industry now. So yeah, you know, we're kind of shifting to that because we see opportunity, right? Opportunity is what drives us. Right? We see that one market can learn from another market. And so if we can bring ideas across markets, that's a good way to expand and grow a business. So these are things we try all the time and we're experimenting with it now and kind of moving into it. But back to your point, the cultural differences, one very important thing that I saw is, so there is an importance, I mean, like being able to execute, depending on how far you go in the value chain of, of services, if you're doing repetitive intensive work and you can do it at a better cost location in, in a time zone that works in a language that works and absolutely you should go after those kind of things I mean that's but I think one thing that I I felt very strongly about when I made this decision to change jobs into this it was the market today what people are buying and what they really want help with these kind of like experience digital proposition development those kind of things they're very short sharp kind of like opportunities right you have to get out there and get it done that's hard to do with a team in a different place. It's much easier to do with people who have experience in a similar context environment, whether that's industry or process or, or business model or whatever it is. But if you can sit and be face to face and really think about together and whiteboard and, and do things on the fly in an agile manner, that model is different. That's small teams, sprints. And I think that is a, I don't know if that's a cultural difference or if it's a shift in the way consulting in general is consumed by companies. But I think, I believe that's what it, what the opportunity is now and what clients are interested in. And there are still big projects and big, you know, implementation programs and those kind of things. But, but I think the real win for 
what we're trying to do is we need to be mobilized to get to where our clients are quickly with an understanding of not only this culture and business culture in the U.S., but what can I learn from others who have advanced far beyond where we are? And some of the, you'd be surprised, like in some cases, there are, there are countries way less developed than ours that actually are, are way beyond us in a certain area, like a certain concept that they've implemented. So being able to actually bring those ideas around the world, I think is important too. So it's so like we will constantly change the way we're going to market and where we're structured based on where's the next opportunity for us to grow. That changes again very fast. It can be every couple months, right? So, and as a small company, you can do that. You can't do it forever, but we can do it how we are now. Definitely. So Eric, I want to be conscious of time that we that we have and, and respect that. I want to thank you for coming on, sharing, you know, just a bit of your journey. I know there's a lot to unpack and a lot more that we could we could go much deeper into, but I want to make sure that people can learn more about you, about Elixir, everything you have guys you, you have going on. I saw some some great case studies and examples on the website. So where's the best place for people to to go and learn more? I think our website's fantastic. I mean, it's it's really the best place to kind of get started and see what we do. And and there's all kinds of ways to get in touch with us through that. So I would say if people want to learn more elixir.com and that's e-l-i-x-i-r and uh, start there and poke around and look at the work we do and the clients we work with and you can even meet the people and there's videos of all of us on there and kind of hear i think it's interesting to hear what we're about what our goals and objectives are and and if that drives some interest reach out contact us sounds good and we will link all that up in the show notes eric and thanks so much for coming on thanks michael enjoyed it good meeting you And there you have it for today's podcast between Michael and Eric. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's podcast. And if you want to help support this show, I'd encourage you to share this episode out with a friend or colleague. As a reminder to book your free growth session call with the Consulting Success team, head over to consultingsuccess.com forward slash grow to book your free call today. Also, a quick reminder, visit consultingsuccess.com where there you're going to find the show notes for today's episode with Eric. Everything referenced in today's episode, including how to connect with Eric on social, you can find over at consultingsuccess.com. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. We'll be back next week with another one. Until next time.